Hello and welcome to The Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, I'm joined by Stephen Conroy from ICBF and manager of the ICBF Tully Bull Performance Centre in Kildare and Paul Smith, Chagas researcher, to get an insight into the Tully Bull Performance Centre, current research findings and its future direction. Stephen and Paul, you're very welcome. Stephen, can you give an update on what's happening in Tully at the moment? Yeah, I suppose the the, the, the whole idea of Tully um, is to capture information, hard to record traits on, on, on animals of interest. And I suppose up until 2012, those animals of interest were pedigree bulls that we used to bring into the centre. But based on a review by Abacus Bio, we now collect uh, information on progeny of AI sires. And I suppose the reason we focus in on these um, AI sires is they're very influential uh, to the industry and we want to capture information as quickly as possible. So we we now um, bring in progeny from uh, these AI sires that are tested through the beef and dairy gene island program predominantly. And how are those cattle from the progeny selected? So the sire is obviously key, as, as I've alluded to. So the first thing was we identified these sires of interest, uh, mainly young bulls, uh, both uh, uh, beef uh, bulls used on the suckler herd, uh, uh, beef bulls used on the dairy herd, and even some dairy dairy uh, crosses coming into the centre as well. And we looked then at the gender. So we want to get uh, 20 cattle to capture the traits of interest, so uh, 20 progeny. So in terms of it then... Uh, some of them progeny will be made up of a mix of uh, steers, heifers, uh, and young bulls. And when we take in a group of progeny, uh, typically 40 at a time, uh, they will all be within a two month uh, uh, window of each other in terms of age. So last year we slaughtered 700 uh, progeny from the center. And as I said, they came in in groups of uh, 40. So as a batch uh, moves in and the data is captured, uh, uh, or it's a uh, data is captured and the animals are slaughtered then a new batch is purchased so we kind of a rollover of stock here all the time in the sheds and once those cattle arrive how are they managed on the farm yeah so just in terms of the, the management I suppose one of the key things is is, is we, we source directly from farms so we work very closely with farms that are involved in the Gene Island programs and uh, from that, then when they come in, then uh, we acclimatize them for 30 days. And, and this is really just a period to get them used to their diet and also to ensure they have all their vaccines. So things like uh, cover them for their clostridia, pneumonias, and then fluke and worms. So to ensure that the animals are all healthy, they go on a, 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 a vaccination and dosing regime. Uh, once they're acclimatized to their feed, so we acclimatize them typically uh, over 18 days up to, uh, I suppose, ad lib uh, feeding. Um, uh, they then go on a 90 day performance test, uh, the average, and where we collect uh, various pieces of information from them. And what tests are you doing for those 90 days? Yeah, so I suppose Tully uh, is part of the Gene Island program where we're, when the animal is born, we're, 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 we send out the semen uh, in the Gene Island program and we capture information uh, from calving data on farms right through to weighing the animals on farms to assessing them for functionality, genetic defects, different pieces of information. And then during the 90 days, as I said, we bring in 20 progeny into Tully we really focus on hard to record or expensive traits and them traits are uh, collecting their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is predominantly the focus is on methane. Uh, then uh, we, we weigh them, we look at their average daily gain. Um, we also then, uh, which is very important, we look at their feed intake, which feeds into the genetic evaluations. It's the main source of information uh, in genetic evaluations. Uh, and then we look at after the uh, end of the 90 days, we slaughter these animals. So we capture uh, meat quality data. So that's eating quality, and that's actually yield data on them. So during their time in the 90 days, one of the, one of the measurements we do of eating quality is we ultrasonically scan the animals on the, basically on the top of their back, on the line, third lumbar vertebrae and the 13th rib. And what we're looking for there is looking at the subcutaneous and intramuscular fat, which are indicators of eating quality. 
And when the animals are slaughtered then at the end of their test in Tully, uh, the carcass is dissected into 23 cuts of meat and that's weighed. And that'll give us an indicator of uh, sires that are producing progeny with more high value cuts because we're looking at the, the strip line, the fillet, the cube roll, these, these cuts that leave a higher value. And obviously we have the yield then as well. And when the animals are in the factory in terms of eating quality, then we, we, we look at the pH drop uh, we also then go in and we uh, rib the carcasses and uh, uh, basically have a machine then that looks at the scans them to, again. So we've done them live in Tully and now we're doing them in the factory that looks at the intramuscular fat again and subcutaneous fat and the colour of the meat. And then what we do is on the day of boning out, typically 72 hours after slaughter, then we uh, take inch take steaks from the strip line and we cut them in and we label them and they're sent then for analysis uh, for taste analysis with trained panelists who are people who are trained in tasting meat to look at tenderness juiciness and flavor but we also send some steaks out to consumers to kind of get a cross validation and they'll also look at the same traits as well so it's really them hard to record traits that are expensive to record on farm uh, just to sum it up, I suppose, it's your methane, your feed intake, and as I said, your, your meat quality traits, eating quality and yield. Stephen, the fact you're putting 700 cattle through per year in Tully, what are the results to date shown? Yeah, so a recent piece of analysis I've done, Catherine, is looking at uh, suckler bred steers. So AI sires, uh, progeny from AI sires coming from the suckler herd. And when I ranked them into indexes, five stars down to one star, uh, based on their terminal index of the animals themselves, uh, the average of the five stars was 142 euro, and the average of the one star was 32 euro. So what that's really telling us is that these five star progeny should be leaving 110 euro more profit than the one star progeny. And as I said already, that's on the terminal index, of these animals themselves. So I good groupings in each of the in each of the groups over hundred progeny in each of the the categories, and when we looked at the average daily gain, they actually had similar average daily gain. So the five star animals grew at one point four kilos a day, and so did the one star animals. So that might surprise a lot of people, but I suppose the terminal index is an economic index, and this is where I suppose it starts to to, to show the benefits of selecting on the five stars. When I actually looked at their feed intake and dry matter, uh, the five stars at two and a half kilos less feed per day. Okay, so they're doing the same live weight gain, but two and a half kilos uh, less feed per day. And based on our current feed costs, that's 85 cents a kilo uh, per day. So over 100 days, that's 85 euros. That's a huge saving that you wouldn't see. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't be measuring the feed that the animals would be eating. And then when the animals were slaughtered, then the five star animals killed out 28 kilos uh, heavier in terms of carcass. And again, if you put that at five euro a kilo based on current prices, that's 140 euro. So where we predicted 110, we're actually far above that now, obviously, because factory price is quite high at the moment. So you're looking at between feed intake, a saving of 85 euro and 140 euro more carcass. And really one of the main contributors to that in terms of the carcasses, the, 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 the animals that were five star killed out much better at 57.5% versus the one stars at 53.7%. So again, the index, the terminal index is, is rewarding animals that have better feed intake, have better carcass weight, better fat scores, and better confirmation, which is coming through in the kill out. So it's, 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 it's probably a, a, a key thing that we're finding the whole time in terms of collecting this feed intake data is that feeding it into the index, the terminal index, it's a weight in the 16% and the replacement index 18%. So it's a very important trait that sometimes can be overlooked by farmers. So that's one of the, the main outcomes, uh, uh, some of the work we've uh, done there recently. And Stephen, I suppose in the coming years, what do you see as the future research and possible trials being carried out? Yeah, so working with Chagas, uh, we, we've started to look at the greenhouse gases in uh, uh, Tully, and we have a lot of information gathered, nearly 1,200 animals now with, 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 with information collected. And we're really looking, I suppose, the, the main, the more potent gas we're looking at is, is methane. So what we hope to do with 
collecting more of this data is to be able to produce genetic evaluations for a trait like methane that we can actually identify sires that are producing progeny uh, that are more, uh, I suppose, efficient in terms of their environmental footprint. So, and, and that linked into then identifying progeny then that are, are good in terms of uh, use of feed. So that's a kind of a key thing to have genetic evaluations for a trait like methane. And also we have uh, a genetic evaluations just starting now for, uh, for meat eating quality so that we can identify sires that produce progeny that uh, produce uh, better eating quality traits such as tender juiciness and flavor. And another thing, I suppose, in terms of the, 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 the coming years, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at, and later this year, we're going to install trots for recording water intakes. So as animals drink water, that gets recorded. So all the animals are totally have an EID. So anything they ever do in the shed, whether it's using the methane boxes, whether it's uh, using the feed intake boxes, they have a transponder in their ear that's uh, recording their level of usage. So we're going to do the same then to get the full picture to see what level does water have in terms of the intake, the, 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 the intake of the animal in terms of its diet, but also in terms of what impact it may potentially have in the, the amount of greenhouse gases that animal produces or the level of methane. And another area, I suppose, we're just looking at is activity meters to see the level of movement of these animals in the shed and get an idea of their temperament uh, in terms of uh, uh, the amount of energy they're burning while they're, they're, they're in the finishing system. So these are kind of areas that we're looking at currently and are, are coming very soon down the line as well in terms of the water intakes and the activity meters. That's great, Stephen. I suppose a lot of new insights coming in the coming years ahead. It's great to see. Yeah, so yeah, it's an exciting area and very relevant, I suppose, in terms of you know, if you look at the whole environmental side of things, you know, we, we know that we can make improvements through breeding, through diet, through, through various initiatives. So it's, it's good that we get in the front foot to help farmers uh, give them the, the correct advice in terms of making these improvements. And I suppose in terms of eating quality, I feel that, you know, we measure the carcass in the factory. Uh, we look at the weight, the confirmation and the fat uh, uh, as part of our payment system. But we're really forgetting about the consumer because at the end of the day, the consumer uh, cares about the, the, the experience they have in eating the meat. So I think it's time that we moved on to look at the eating quality in terms of uh, thinking of the end user. Because we know if a consumer has a bad experience in terms of meat, they may not um, uh, uh, purchase meat for, for, for up to 60 days. So we want to ensure they have a good experience every time. Paul. I suppose Stephen has touched on methane emissions and it's a major challenge facing the agricultural sector and you're involved with the Room and Predict project. Can you tell me more about it? Yeah, Catherine. So as part of this Room and Predict project, which was funded by the, Fer the FASA Aragas uh, Fund through the European Union, uh, basically as part of this project, we installed green feed systems, which are uh, machines that are used to measure methane emissions uh, on beef cattle. So we installed these machines at the ICBF Progeny Test Centre in Tully. Um, so this was a collaboration, this, this project was a collaboration between Chagas, UCD and ICBF. So I suppose as part of this project since 2019, we began measuring methane emissions on all the animals that pass through the, through the Progeny Test Centre. And over a year and a half period, we collected um, data on just under 300 animals. I suppose as part of this project, one of the main things we we're looking to do at, I suppose, is try and see if there's a way in which we could look to, to I suppose, breed animals um, for a lower methane output. So particularly with, with methane emissions, one of the big drivers of an animal's level of methane output is their level of, um, is the amount of food that the animal eats. But also, I suppose, the amount of food the animal eats is also a key contributor to, to the animal's, I suppose, growth rate and subsequent performance. So I suppose one of the key things we are trying to do as part of the, the Room Predict project is try and see if there's a way in which we could breed animals to basically, I suppose, simultaneously reduce their, their level of methane output, but at the same time, um, I suppose, either have no impact on the, the, I suppose, to try and limit the, the, the negative impacts, which could, I suppose, ultimately come from, from, from breeding animals with a lower methane output. So I suppose as part of the project, as I said, we measured methane output on just under 300 animals. 
um, and subsequently we looked at a variety of different ways to express the animal's level of methane output so that was methane output per, per grams per day per unit of feed intake or as part of this new index called the residual methane emissions index so basically the way this trait works it's a difference between the animal's predicted level of methane output based on their level of feed intake and body weight and the actual amount of methane they produce and um, i suppose obviously with this trait we're looking for animals that um, produce less methane than they are uh, predicted to do so so i suppose as part of the project we as i said we calculate emissions on on 300 animals we subsequently then rank these animals in terms of their, their in terms of their residual methane emissions index into high medium and low uh, emitting animals and after this then we suppose we try to compare the groups in terms of the amount of methane they emitted per day per kilogram of carcass output and i suppose we wanted to see also if there's any difference in the animal's level of performance between the between the high medium and low groups Ultimately, at the end of the trial, we found that there was a 30% difference in methane output between, between high and low animals. So the low animals emitted 30% less methane in comparison to their, to, their, to their high counterparts. I suppose the key thing as well we also found is that there was no difference in terms of the animal's level of productivity. So there was no difference in feed intake, growth rate, uh, feed efficiency, or carcass output between the high and low, uh, low methane emitting animals. What do you think are the main mitigation strategies going forward? To suppose catching going forward, there's predominantly two ways in which we can look to reduce methane emissions. So we I suppose there's looking at breeding animals and um, to produce less methane. So it's, that's kind of following on from the work that's been carried out in Tully to date. I suppose then the other thing that we can look at is trying to feed animals these anti-methanogenic um, uh, compounds. So basically feeding animals supplements that will reduce the amount of methane they produce in the rumen. And I suppose the key thing both um, both strategies is ultimately we want to, I suppose, try and reduce the amount of methane the animal produces per day. So that's, and then ultimately as well, try and reduce the amount of methane the animal uh, produces over the, over the lifetime of the animal. So I suppose if we can uh, breed animals that I suppose grow faster or um, basically what will we do look to do through this strategy is basically try and reduce the days of slaughter and uh, reduce the days of slaughter for individual animals, which would ultimately then, I suppose, result in less methane being produced over the lifetime of the animal and help to, to reduce total methane emissions from the system. I suppose following on from the figures that Stephen has after given us, there seems to be a clear link between reducing the age to slaughter, the feed intake, and particularly on the slaughter carcasses. Do you think there will be a link between the reducing of the methane emissions and the profitability? Yeah, so I suppose some kind of preliminary data that we've shown from, from data that we've generated at Tully um, is that we're seeing that there is a negative relationship between the animal's level of methane output and their, their, their rankings in terms of the terminal index, which basically, I suppose, somewhat suggests that animals that are more profitable in the terminal index are ultimately um, producing less methane. So it's kind of preliminary analysis at the moment, but it is suggesting that the, the indexes are going the right direction in terms of reducing the amount of methane the animal produces. And this is probably somewhat been um, as a result of the waiting for feed intake in, in, in the terminal index, because as I said, feed intake is one of the main drivers uh, for the amount of methane that the, that the animal will subsequently produce. That's all for this week's episode, and my thanks to Shane and Paul for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.